So I'll introduce her first because there's a little story about this program. Um, I worked in Sacramento for 32 years in the state capitol. I met Susan while working there because she was the head of the California Council on Science and Technology. After she had been the dean of the School of Engineering at UC Riverside, uh, she then um, helped this program get started, which is a group of um, academic uh, <clears throat> and science researchers from around the state, from all of our campuses, both the UC system, CSU, community colleges, and the federal laboratories, and they advise um, people in state government on science issues. Out of that, that's how our relationship grew because I was working for uh, four different state senators over the course of the time that I worked in Sacramento, all of whom were interested in those kind of policy issues. So I met Susan early on. Um, she retired in 2017, as did I, and I moved down here. I live in Palm Desert now. She moved to Santa Barbara, but she went back over to the campus and met some of um, her new students as well as some former students and they all were kind of really interested in this whole thing about science and how this was in the the early era if you may remember when washington dc was not friendly to science um, and there was a big march for science so we're kind of coming on the tail end of that and um, she met several students who really wanted to know more about the policy world and how can we make our research relevant to what decisions are being made um, in the state capitol. So she called me up and said, come over, I want you to have dinner with some um, people I've met on the UCR campus. I went over and the dean of the school of public policy at that time was there, the dean of the school of engineering. We had several grad students in the room, we had dinner and we chit chatted. And they started asking me a lot about my experience, both working in the state capitol and I had worked in Washington DC for 10 years as well. And all of a sudden, I started to feel like, this feels like an interview. I'm, what's going on here? The very next day, I get a call. Let's put together a program to help our science um, PhD candidates in the STEM sciences and the social sciences learn more about how the policy world works um, at both the state and the federal level. And from that, a program grew. Susan and I spent one afternoon with two engineering students and we whiteboarded this whole program that you're going to get a sample of this evening. Um, so that's kind of the background of how we got there. Thank you very much. Boy, do I need help. <laughs> so this is the mission statement that the students came up with. And as you can see, it's civic minded scientists um, and I hope you're going to see what that means as our students compete for a prize this evening. Um, but to figure out how they can make their research and their training applicable to help decision makers who have to make tough decisions, elected officials in particular who are under a lot of pressure. Um, so we kind of taught them how they can do that by um, virtue of a certificate class. This is a 10 week program that all of the students you'll meet tonight have been through. And what we do is give them very practical training. They're scientists, they're engineers. And we tell them how to write a, um, a legislative bill analysis, how to write a press release, how to write an op-ed to be published in a newspaper. We give them practical skills that they need in order to take their science knowledge out to the, the community and particularly to help um, those policymakers who have to make the tough decisions. So from that, um, we decided, so this 10 week course, there's our most recent graduate group. We've graduated five uh, classes now. Um, from that, some of them had made, uh, by the way, one of the things they do is make a policy pitch. You're gonna get a sample of those this evening. Um, but we decided to take them to Sacramento um, this past summer. And they actually met with legislators and legislative staff and did their policy pitches, which you can see some of the topics over there on the right uh, hand side. These are things that they decided they wanna focus on. And 
Um, we had a great day in Sacramento. Unfortunately, we didn't meet as many people as we wanted because um, it was still under um, COVID uh, restrictions at that time. So a lot of people were working virtually. Although I think we did meet a couple of legislators in the process. And by the way, it's not only legislators, it's also the executive branch. We met with some of the governor's staff as well. But for these young scientists to actually get exposed to um, real people with political power, if you will, it was quite an experience for them. We also placed them as we can find elected officials who would like to have a fellow. For, t for 10 weeks, they do research on a particular topic. This was one um, recent one. Gabriel worked for assembly member Thurston Smith. He goes by Smitty Smith. He's from the Apple Valley area. And they were having a problem, still having a problem there with illegal cannabis um, grows that are in that area. Gabriel did a, an incredible overlay of a whole bunch of different maps of data that helped them figure out where the biggest problems were, what law enforcement needs to do to get in there, what they can, um, <clears throat> who's using electricity illegally, who's tapping water illegally. He was able to map all that out and help them. Another one of our past students worked with Assemblywoman Eloise Reyes, and she did a, a district survey. It was particularly kind of started on the issue of racism in, in the district and how people perceived um, problems of, around racism. Um, and it turned into a full report. Then she collected a lot of data, and it was published by the assembly member. We have several others. In fact, I'm kind of looking for not everyone here, but some of these students you're going to hear from tonight have done, um, additionally done fellowships. One, um, Chris worked for the Mountain, help me out, what's the name of the organization? Right. So he, you know, you might want to talk to him to learn a bit more about his experience. Um, who else had a fellowship? Who'd you work for? Oh, that's right. You're working for a congressman right now. And his presentation this evening is going to be very interesting because it's based on the research he's doing. Um, we want to find more local officials. By the way, we have a couple of elected officials here as judges. These guys would like to come help you do your job if, if you think um, they can be of help to you. Locally, another project our students have worked on is the Prescott Preserve, which you know is the Mesquite golf course that's now being converted. Um, Elijah is taking the lead right now of our team of students, and they're going to bring in faculty to help really figure out what's the science behind the particular um, kinds of species and wildlife, whatever needs to be um, converted um, in that space. Um, so we will continue to keep our relationship going. Um, with the Oswit Land Trust. Um, and they, by the way, we'll, we'll thank them again, but um, <laughs> they uh, provided some funding for some of the prizes for our students tonight. So I'm going to turn it over to Jenna Roper, who is a PhD candidate in the School of Engineering. She's going to be the MC for our little competition this evening, and I will let her take it away. Thanks, Doug. All right, so we're going to move into the main part of our evening, which is the policy pinch competition. Um, we're going to have five PhD students giving a five minute presentation, pitching a creative policy solution to a local issue. The presentations will be judged by our special guest judges who I'll introduce now. And if you could stand when I introduce you so the audience um, can know who you are. Um, first, we have Karina Quintanilla, a longtime Coachella Valley resident, UCR alum, and Palm Desert Mayor Pro Temp. Next, we have David Pearson, the Managing Director of Entrepreneurial Programs at UCR. Um, we have Laura James, the Vice President of Innovation for the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership. 
Uh, we have Ann Cheney, Assistant Professor of Social Medicine, Population and Public Health at UCR. And then we have Indio Mayor Oscar Ortiz. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, the presentations will be judged based on uh, strong communication that's clear, concise, and effective, the feasibility and impact of the proposed policy, and the creativity of the policy ideas. So we'll have each student uh, present for five minutes, followed by five minutes for questions from our judges. And then after all of the students present, the audience will have a chance to ask questions. Um, so without further ado, we'll start with our first presenter, Elijah Hall, a PhD candidate in the Department of Evolution, Ecological and Organismal Biology. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Elijah. I'm a PhD student at UC Riverside, and I'm currently a Science to Policy Fellow in the office of Congressman Mark Takano. Did you know that the voters of San Bernardino County voted to potentially succeed from the state in November? While the succession part of this ballot measure was what caught everyone's attention, this um, ballot measure was really about San Bernardino County getting an equitable share of the state budget. This has been a long time issue and it's what I'm going to focus on today. Um, so as you may know, the state budget is a combination of funds from uh, state taxes and federal taxes that are dispersed to counties in order for them to administer services and programs that we all use every day. And Riverside County is unique for a number of reasons. Um, we are the only or one of the few counties that's projected to increase in population size over the next 40 years and we're actually um, the highest, uh, we have the highest estimated growth increase. And in addition to that, we have a high amount of, uh, of needs, uh, especially concerning healthcare. We have the fourth, num the fourth highest number of, um, of uh, residents who are uh, eligible for Medi-Cal and enrolled in Medi-Cal, Medi which is uh, Medicaid. So we have a high number of low income individuals who are in need of uh, of healthcare. And uh, in addition to that, we have substantial healthcare needs. Riverside County has a higher than average percentage of individuals who experience delayed prescriptions and medical services. We have a higher number uh, than average uh, number of individuals who are in fair or poor health. And we have a higher percentage of individuals who are currently uninsured. So clearly we have uh, a large population that is growing um, in needs and size. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the data um, around healthcare funding through the state budget. So here you can see um, the changes in healthcare funding uh, provided by state taxes over time with Riverside County in the red. And among the 58 uh, counties in California, we are ranked 48th out of uh, the 58. And if we look at this uh, more holistically in terms of total funding from the state budget, so this includes health care and all the other services that counties provide, we are ranked 49th out of 58 counties in how much money we are getting per person. So these are all standardized per capita. So clearly there's a large amount of variability in how much funding per capita each county receives. And we are, in fact, receiving a very low proportion of that comparatively. And we can take an example of this by comparing Riverside County to Los Angeles County. So here we have uh, health care administration funding from federal sources, mental health care funding from state sources, and then total funding from the budget. The black line is Riverside County funding, the red line is Los Angeles County funding, and the blue line in the middle is what Riverside County would be receiving if we got the same per capita money as Los Angeles County. And this uh, combined represents over $818 million every year that we could be receiving if we, have, if we are funded like Los Angeles County. 
Um, so this obviously begs the question, how else can we get funding that is more equitable compared to the state budget? Um, and an example of this is the American Rescue Plan Act, which was signed by Joe Biden in 2021 to, uh, to combat the COVID-19 pandemic, and it distributed funding directly to counties. And when we look at this graph, which compares the amount of funding received through the ARP Act compared to population size, we can see that there's basically a, a one to one line where the larger the county, the more money they received. And this is a great example of a more equitable uh, uh, formula that provides funding directly to counties. So what can we do next? As individuals, I would like to encourage you all to contact your elected officials, your state officials, and ask them what they can do to make the state budget more equitable. And um, for your elected officials, uh, I encourage you all to invite them to join our coalition that I, we're starting um, in my fellowship with Congressman Takano uh, so that we can bring these issues to the state capitol and find a more equitable solution uh, so that we can all receive the, amount, the same amount of money that we deserve in pay in taxes. And with that, I'd like to thank my fellowship and uh, Congressman Mark Takano and uh, especially thank UCER Science to Policy. Thank you. And I'll take any questions. I have a question. Um, so can you share a little bit about why you think the funding is not equitable between, for instance, Riverside and LA County? Yeah, so um, in, in with healthcare in particular or uh, through the mental health care funding? Yeah, so the mental health care funding and this is uh, has a lot to do with Medicaid specifically. That's uh, one of the major ways that uh, state and federal funds are used through uh, through Medi-Cal. And it has a lot to do with the uh, demographics of the county. Uh, so, um, for example, the the funding is is mostly used where the services are performed and then there's a reimbursement process so um, it can be through that but it also includes funding for administrative costs that um that yeah uh, vary so uh yeah it's it's this is kind of a cop-out but it's very complicated and uh, <laughs> i wish i could tell you a more definitive answer but i'm still kind of working on that and trying to dig into the details I have a question. Do you think LA County is getting too much funding per capita or are we getting too little funding per capita or is it both? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if I can speak on whether or not LA County is getting too much funding, um, but uh, when I showed the percentages of uh, individuals who are receiving delayed health care and individuals who are uninsured, we have higher percentages than LA County, which um, definitely suggests that we are underfunded comparatively. Thank you. My question is, given that we are the largest county geographically in the state of California, and we know that we have the lowest rates of access to physicians, how can we increase the speed of Medi-Cal billing? Is that something that's popped up into mind? I know that's a little bit more on the admin side, but do you have any possible interventions to make it easier for our physicians to get quicker reimbursement? Um, I, I don't think I can give you a good answer about that. I, I focus on the budget and um, one of the things that I'm doing moving forward, I'm about halfway through my fellowship, um, is to start talking with uh, folks at the, the county public health and Riverside University public uh, health system, public health unit. So um, I'll definitely bring that question to them and, and see what we can do about it. Much appreciated, thank you. Uh, my my question relates to the size and the power of the coalition that you would need to change this traje trajectory. Um, there would be 47 and 48 counties who would probably oppose getting a smaller share of the pie so that we could get a larger share of the pie. So how, how can this coalition be built to be effective? 
Hmm. Um, <laughs> uh, that's a really good question. Uh, I don't know. I think so. When I I I can't show the data here, but when I look at the data, there's like a huge variability in which counties are being underfunded in certain categories. So, um, in any in any category throughout the state budget, which has like dozens and dozens of like columns where funding are going to different uses. Um, counties are being uh, kind of shorted in different ways. So um, I guess what uh, we're trying to argue is that like this is an equity issue and whether or not you're being underfunded with healthcare specifically, it, it likely is impacting a service in your county one way or another. But um, yeah, that's a, that's a great uh, idea to, to keep in mind is how to work, work with that. And uh, a quick last uh, question. First of all, congratulations on a very clean presentation. Graphically, very interesting also. Um, have you had a look at the sub-regions of the county to see how much disparity there is between, let's say, the, you know, the valley that we're sitting in and Temecula, for example? Yeah, that's um, not something that I've been able to do so far. The way the state budget works is it's really broken down at the county level, but that's definitely an area that I want to to look into more because especially like um, with Congressman Takano's district, it's Western Riverside County. So the impacts there are likely different than out here in in Coachella Valley. Um, but yeah, that's uh, something that we're, we're looking into uh, moving forward. Okay. And that's time. So thank you all very much. And, and... Thanks, Elijah. Uh, quickly, I forgot to mention before, but in addition to the uh, judges who will choose a first and second place winner, the audience will be voting on the People's Choice Award. So everyone got a ballot when they came in. Keep that in mind. Um, you will be voting at the end. Okay, so next, our next speaker is Chris Radnicki, a PhD candidate in mechanical engineering. Hello, okay, I'm good. Uh, hello, I'm Chris Radnicki. Okay, uh, I'm Chris Radnicki, a PhD in mechanical engineering. This is not what I'll be talking about today. Uh, I also have done a lot of research on net energy metering, but that is also not what I will be talking about today. Um, but if you have questions, you can ask me later, but that does not mean I have uh, uh, solutions for what you should do with your house. So let me just stop that now. Uh, today, I'm gonna be talking about oil and gas well cleanup. Okay, so, oh, do I have a clicker? There we go. So uh, some of these numbers are a little out to date, but the general trajectory of this is the same. Um, so there's two problems, uh, and this is during COVID, so in 2020. Uh, there were a bunch of fossil fuel jobs lost um, and these are people that work on these oil wells uh, they know how to work them uh, and decommissioning these oil wells is actually a really complicated process it's not one that everyone can just do um, and so it is also a generally a precarious job um, so I, I tend to think about when i have solutions of trying to move towards green energy or whatever we want to do how do we take care of the people that we may or may not be leaving behind um, and so then the second thing is that there is a lot of work to be done. So CCST, the California Council of Science and Technology, uh, they found there's over 100,000 of these oil wells that need to be plugged or abandoned. Um, California started drilling for oil in early 1900, I think even in the 1800s. Um, and some of these are still around, just holes in the ground, methane coming out. So there's three types of uh, Three types of wells. So an abandoned well is one that has been decommissioned. So the well has been filled up with cement and the state says, okay, you're good to go. And that's the end of it. Um, those wells can leak. So it is good to be monitoring them. But in general, as far as the state is concerned, they're done. Idle wells are wells that are no longer producing oil, but there is a company that still ha owns this oil well and the oil well can be potentially leaking. And they're Usually there are fines for having an idle well, and these fines escalate over time, but they're very small. As you can see, CalGEM, which is the organization that uh, regulates these oil wells, they only have 1% of the needed funds to plug these wells. The last one is an orphan well. This is the worst case scenario. So this is when the company is upped and left. There's no one who uh, we can point to that owns the well. And this is where the state actually has to come in and, and decommission the well itself. 
Um, and so studies show that all these wells could be leaking um, and they're leaking methane, which can, t can be a lot worse than CO2. So uh, some of you may have heard of some of these. I don't think any of them were around here. The Arvin gas leaks in uh, Bakersfield and LA and Alicia Canaan. Um, but all of these took days, if not weeks to be fixed and for people to come in and actually recognize the problem. So um, my uh, so part of the big issue too is not just that they're leaking out in the atmosphere, but that it's posing a danger to communities. I mean, some of these the uh, gas was leaking into houses for weeks on end, and people were breathing the air without even really knowing. Um, so we want to. So that brings me to the solution, which is we want to provide. I think we should provide CalGem with the adequate funds to be able to plug and uh, decommission all these wells themselves, and so that will take it. That would. Uh, take it out of a company's hand and make sure that these wells are decommissioned in the right way. And the second part of that is that we could then have a part of the uh, CalGem that's a well response hotline. So there's a place to go when these, these wells leak, when we notice there's a problem, there's, somewhere, there's someone that's actually responsible for coming in and fixing them. The question that everyone always wants to ask is, well, how do you pay for it? Uh, the first one is that you can increase these idle well fees scaled over time. So right now they're really, really small. I mean, as you can see, we have a huge problem and these idle well fees are not stopping um, the problem from getting worse. So that's one way to do it. Uh, the second one is to increase capital gains tax on, um, on the fossil fuel companies. So I, I think, and we all kind of agree that generally if it's a company that's still digging a hole that they should be the ones cleaning it up. And so in a way we want to be able to get that money up front in an in an, uh, earlier, so that the well doesn't eventually become abandoned and orphaned, and then the state has to come in later. Um, and the last one is just to set aside a corporate tax on uh, fossil fuel companies. I mean, if you want to drill in California, then we need to have the money, the funds, to be able to clean this up when it comes out at the end. Um, so, moving forward, uh, this and always uh, mandatory about no more new drilling um, is obviously a big one. And I got a lot of this from uh, Megan Milliken. Uh, and she, it works a little bit better as a federal solution, but uh, I've adapted it somewhat to a California solution. Um, and I don't know, if, thank you. And if you have any questions. Hi, thank you, that was excellent. I was looking up some info before I got here, and it looks like as of 2021, there's over 130 um, wells now. Surprise me. Uh, absolutely. My question is, in the 9.1 million that you're talking about cleanup, is that under uh, President Biden's uh, funding, or is this the state of California that would need to fund that? Uh, so that is an estimate from CCST as to what it would take to clean up the 107,000 it was. And my suspicion is that is a less than what would actually be needed um, because it depends on how old the well is as to how much you have to do. Um, so it, it varies, but yeah, that, 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 that estimate is generally what it would take to clean, the, clean up all the wells now. Um, where that funding comes from, that's, that's the next question. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Uh, I have a question and I think it's a two part question. The first one is, with those taxes that you said to, to raise those nine million nine billion dollars, yeah. how much do you think that would impact the price for a gas gasoline? Se second would be um, how much if we don't fix them, how does how much does that cost us in other issues, right? With healthcare and yeah. uh, cleanup sites, that kind of stuff. Okay, let me do this twofold. Uh, so it's for the first part, how much would it increase the price of gasoline? Uh, I don't know that. I'm not going to put a number on it. Um, my question or the way I would look at that is, well, do what do we value? I mean, we, we, we have these wells. They're putting out oil into the or not oil, but gases into the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. It's a problem and it's not going to go away. And it's a problem that needs to be solved at some point. Um, and so I, I think the question about gas is a is a separate one that we should also be looking at to solve. But the question of cleaning up these oil, these the drilling from the last hundred and hundred fifty years, is one that we need to solve. So I'm ducking it a little bit, but I'll. <laughs> uh, the second one was, sorry. Uh, 
are there any costs that you can um, foresee of not cleaning up? Like what, what are the costs that you're seeing from these uh, not being cleaned up? Yeah, so, so to me, the, the biggest thing to me that kind of rubs in the back of my mind is a lot of these oil wells, we're not even producing, getting the oil out. I mean, they're just, they're just running and leaking. So we're sitting there with a bunch of these wells that are, and if you drive around, you'll see ones going up and down. Sometimes they're not boiling oil. So if they're leaking out gases and we're not even getting the oil out, well, that's a, that's a huge cost. I mean, that we're, we're, we're putting out greenhouse gases and not even being able to drive our cars with that oil. So to me, it's, it, we're, it's, we're, it, we're all losing in that situ situation as opposed to getting something out at least. So I have a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that the leaking methane, it causes, it's dangerous to communities and families and it causes respiratory problems, for instance, among children. So my question is, who are the families affected and what kind of political leverage do they have? Uh, unfortunately, uh, it generally uh, in California and elsewhere, it, it tends to be lower income communities that are facing these problems. Um, and so they obviously have, unfortunately, less political capital than other ones. Um, so, I think that answers your question more so. Are you aware of any other state that has tackled this problem successfully? Oh, uh, no, not tackled the problem, no. But Louisiana has a huge problem with this as well um, in the Gulf of Mexico or uh, off the shore. Um, Texas, I know, has a huge thing, but they're, they're not really. Has there been any other type of industry where, you know, this magnitude of problem has been tackled? Like mining, for example. Yeah. Not that I could think of, but that's a good question. Yeah, so you're asking if there's a company that's kind of gone in and tried to um, decommission wells in a way? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't know anything about that, but that's a good question. I will look that up after this. If we have time for one last quick question, the the last case, worst case scenario type of well that you talked about, which, which have been- Orph you know, Orphaned wells. Orphaned wells. Is there any process for the state or a, a state designated entity to take those over and turn those into income producing assets somehow to help pay for um, closing others up? Yeah, so so it, so typically the or, orphan wells and idle wells, the reason they're they're orphan and idle is because the company, the oil that they're getting out isn't worth the price of going back in. So the idle wells, for instance, it's cheaper to just pay the idle well fees than it is to actually go in and clean up the well itself. Um, so no, unfortunately, but yeah, but CalGem is then responsible for going in and getting those orphan wells and decommissioning them. But that's a good idea of trying to raise funds that way as well. Thank you for listening and uh, happy to answer your questions later. Our next presenter is Sarah Bobart from the department, a PhD candidate in the Department of Genetics, Genomics, and Bioinformatics. I think I'll stand over here. Shake it up a little bit. <laughs> All right, yes, hi everyone. I'm Sarah, I'm PhD candidate in the Genetics Department in the School of Medicine at UC Riverside and talking about diverting a crisis, a historic really reinvestment in senior healthcare. I started getting interested in this topic because uh, last year my mom retired, 35 years, public school teacher, and just started thinking about what does retirement look like for her? She's, she's only 60, so how can, we, how can we make it the best possible in the future for her? So I think most people are aware that uh, we have a rapidly aging population in the United States, um, and I kind of will be shifting a little bit on the federal side for this because some of these things just are federal, uh, and then how we can kind of look at that on on a local level. Um, but by the year 2060, we'll have almost 100 million people over the age of 65, right? So what can we do about that, right? How can we have the best retirement population in the United States? Uh, so I actually just recently, yes, right? <laughs> I recently just got back from Japan uh, thinking about they have currently the largest uh, population per capita of elderly people. And, and what do they do is kind of the thing that I was curious about while I was there. Uh, one of the big things is, of course, promoting this active social retirement. This woman here in the middle is 90 and she leads this uh, cheerleading group. Uh, so just thinking about ways that we can kind of promote that, that active lifestyle. Um, 
in their retirement, sort of quasi-retirement, because a lot of times um, the Japanese actually get another job after they retire, sort of a retirement type job to kind of keep themselves um, just busy, right, and doing things. Um, and also just other innovative tools, right? So one thing that uh, Japan is very famous for is robots, right? And how we can use robots to just have more interactive uh, opportunities for folks and also actually providing care. So some of this stuff uh, is talked about in the National Geographic article by Sarah Lubman, definitely recommend it. Um, but when we go back to the United States, I was actually really shocked to find out that Medicare does not cover long-term care. So care for any extended period of time. And I was like, that can't possibly be true. So I looked it up on Medicare's website and it says it right there, long-term care, not covered. Whereas in Japan, it actually is covered. Long-term care is covered. And this is for like lengthy home care uh, support. And so I thought about how is that possible? How does Japan cover this? And how could we potentially steal some of their good ideas? Uh, so what they do is they have a public long-term care insurance plan, which actually does not get paid for until you are 40. And when you're 40, a new tax kicks in, and this tax covers long-term care with a 10% copay. Fascinating, I think. So this is something that I think um, we should think of and potentially is my first federal proposal on the US side is that this could be a way to reinvest in Medicare. We had an initial investment in the creation of Medicare, obviously. Uh, but how do we kind of spread that uh, and make it last a little bit longer? And some people would say, we can't afford another tax, obviously, but I would say we can afford not to have another tax. So senior long-term care facility lasts, it costs about $7,000 a month on average. So perhaps another tax would be potentially worth it to offset a monthly cost like that to families. Right? Um, and then, so this is my kind of reinvestment in senior care so that this will be a kind of a long-term last. On the other side of things, so kind of shifting away from federal and how can we kind of promote this on a local level is that we simply do not have enough Medicare workers or workers that specialize in geriatrics. So according to the uh, American Association of Medical Colleges, of the recent specialties last year, 60,000 new pediatricians, 5,000 new geriatricians, right? So how do we kind of shift this movement, right? How do we get folks willing to enter the geriatrics field and actually geriatricians have the highest rates of of uh, job satisfaction so how do we tell people like actually this is a great job right and so a couple things we can have medical school scholarships so we already have scholarships at the school of medicine to support folks who want to stay local how about to stay local and focus on geriatrics and also of course expedite immigration Right, so 28% of physicians and almost 40% of home health care workers are immigrants. And we have a 4 million person wait list on the visa application uh, to enter the United States. So I think we can kind of expedite the process and get us some more geriatricians. And that is it for me. Any questions? I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Um, when you compare US and Japan, mm. it, do you have any comparisons for the cost? How do they compare in terms of how much we pay here, you know, whether it's a percentage or lifetime cost versus Japan? For taxes in general or for? For uh, healthcare. Oh yeah, for a healthcare tax? N not or, tax, but just Yeah, yeah, how much they pay in healthcare in general. I mean, obviously the United States has the most expensive healthcare system. One of the reasons for that is we're one of the most specialized, right? So we have, so the United States is a great place to be for healthcare if you have a very specific disease, right? Because we're kind of on the leading edge of research, right? So many of the most recent uh, cutting edge COVID treatments, for example, came from the United States because we kind of lead the, the way on research. It's a, there's a big can of worms on that, <laughs> on, on why do we pay the most for the things that we invent? Um, but yeah, so, so we can cut costs for sure, yeah. Okay, so I have a question. Um, yeah. You mentioned that one potential solution to be addressed that to support this um, policy would be to expedite 
the immigration process. So that's a tough, a tough subject. What would be your argument that would appeal to, let's say, Democrats and Republicans about why we should do that? I think that uh, the that we need them, right? That there's opportunity for them, absolutely, right? That the I mean, of course, there's the classic a nation of immigrants, right? But the this balance will only be shifted through immigration. It's something that Japan always talks about, but doesn't actually do, right? And I think that we could do the same, right? We always say, well, we need more physicians, we need more local physicians, we need more home health care aides, etc. But we have to be serious about it. So I think that that's, that's kind of the idea there. Yeah. Can I ask um, why you chose long term care uh, from the three different uh, pro you know, three different topics in Japan, instead of addressing um, an active lifestyle, what could be done there or robotics for, you know, increasing interactivity. I think, well, for one thing, because I'm more on the insurance side of things in terms of my experience. Okay. Uh, and also, it was just my starkest surprise <laughs> that I, I thought for sure that was something that there was insurance for in the United States. And obviously, <laughs> that, that shows my naivete when I researched it, and I was very surprised. And so I thought, does any other country cover this? So that's, that's why I got interested. And uh, congratulations on the story about your mother and uh showing the picture of the japanese women exercising there yeah it's great right I love everybody can re everybody can relate to it so uh, there's dozens of pictures like this on this article so i i super recommend yeah, yeah. <laughs> this was just the cutest <laughs> uh, you you've mentioned home health care workers and they are traditionally very low paid workers mm -hmm. would you propose any solution towards making those jobs a little more appealing by somehow increasing the rate that people are paid for doing them because yes. they're not easy jobs. <laughs> no, they're not easy jobs. Right. And uh, I was talking to um, the CEO of a hospital about this, and she said, we're losing workers because they can get a job at Amazon lifting boxes or whatever for $20 an hour, and we're paying them less for harder work. Right. So we need to be serious about that. And it will raise the costs, which just means simply the money has to come from somewhere for sure. So, yeah, I at the beginning of the pandemic, I was working in senior care and I was the activities coordinator so I can see all of the benefits I mean we were doing water aerobics and all kinds of fun stuff. That also let me see that there's a potential for elder abuse mm. so in your, your research, did you find anything in terms of the cost that was the variation for like dementia care versus active senior living versus the dependent care and I know that's a big spectrum to throw at you, but is there anything that stood out in that? I haven't, I don't have a ton of research on that topic, but so important, right? So this is something that I've been thinking about for years. Um, my grandparents lived at home for 10 years with dementia, uh, which is actually kind of kind of started jump starting thinking about like, how is this possible? And how are we going to take care of of just this, the generation that deserves it, right? We, we have uh, our work cut out for us. So I don't have exact data on that but but certainly i think it's very important thank you yeah <laughs> rapid round yeah <laughs> thank you sarah we'll now move to chris cosma a phd candidate in ecology Alrighty. Hello, everyone. My name is Chris Cosma. I'm a PhD candidate in ecology at UC Riverside, and my research focuses on nocturnal pollination by moths. Um, but today what I'm going to be talking about is how to beat the light pollution blues. So when you see the word pollution, you probably think about things like air pollution or maybe train derailments, spilling chemicals. But there's another form of pollution that's increasing all around us, and that's light pollution. So light from street lights and billboards and parking lots, and even the lights that we use at our homes are all increasing worldwide and have actually increased by almost 300% in the last 25 years. The problem is especially pronounced 
in California, which stands out like a beacon on light pollution maps in the West. So you may be wondering, who cares it's just light? Well, the reason why we call it pollution is because it's been linked to everything from sleep disorders to obesity and even certain forms of cancer. And besides humans, it also affects other organisms, especially nocturnal organisms like moths, which are attracted to artificial light at night. And this actually increases their risk of predation by bats and other predators. It also disrupts important pollination services that moths provide to both wild and agricultural plants, including, including avocados. So if you like avocados, thank the moths. <laughs> um, it also disrupts the migration patterns of many of our native songbirds, which actually predominantly migrate at night. So let's be realistic here. These lights aren't going anywhere. We need them for things like lighting our paths at night and generally to keep our community safe. But there is something we can do to diminish their impact and doing that requires an understanding of the science behind light pollution. So when we see light from street lights or wherever else that appears yellow or white, what we're actually seeing there is composed of many different colors along the visible spectrum. And it turns out that light color matters. So blue light in particular is really bad for humans and other organisms. And unfortunately, that's exactly the type of light that's increasing most right now as we transition from incandescent bulbs to new, more energy efficient LED bulbs. So our old incandescent bulbs were less energy efficient, but they also emitted much less blue light. And unfortunately now our LEDs, which are more energy efficient and have been promoted because of this, also emit much more blue light. So how do we beat the light pollution blues? Well, one thing we can do is use alternative LEDs that emit, emit much less blue light. And these, um, a good example of these are called amber LEDs. And these are widely available. They're, they emit less blue light. They're just as energy efficient as the alternative LEDs. They're actually preferred by residents in part because they limit glare. So they're also potentially safer for driving and other nighttime activities. So there's a couple things that everyone can do to help with this. Number one, you can convert your LEDs to these alternative amber LEDs. You can also use motion sensors and timers and shields. And these are other forms of technology that can help direct light only where and when it's needed. And lastly, you can contact your local representatives. And that brings me to my next point. What our elected officials should be doing about this issue of light pollution? City governments can pass local ordinances to limit blue light from outdoor lighting, for example, by using these blue light reducing bulbs. And then our state government in California can amend Title 24 of the California Code of Regulations. This is our California Energy Code, and we can include explicit blue light reduction requirements for all outdoor lighting. And with these simple actions, we can all avoid the light pollution blues. And that will make our nighttime environment safer for us, but also with all the other organisms that we share them with. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Um, can you tell us what the experience has been with the Dark Skies uh, project in Anza Borrego? Did they address some of these issues? Well, that's actually news to me. I haven't heard that they're doing that there. Um, so my most of what I know about the Dark Sky Initiative is from Flagstaff, Arizona, which kind of served as the model for the rest of the world, or the rest of the U.S. at least. Um, I haven't really looked into what happened with Anza Borrego. You probably know more than I do. Were they trying to limit blue light? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. They're the only yeah. city in this region that advertises itself as a Dark Skies. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so part of part of certifying yourself as a dark sky area usually means uh, doing things like reducing the amount of blue light. In general, it means just reducing the amount of artificial light at night. Um, but but for example, the city of Flagstaff, Arizona, converted all of their outdoor lighting to amber LEDs. This is a local ordinance there, um, in part because Flagstaff is a really important. Uh, uh, city for observatories, so they have a lot of astronomy um, using telescopes, and that that's really what uh, 
kind of promoted this whole idea of dark sky, but now we're learning a lot more about how artificial light at night, in particular, this blue light is bad for nocturnal organisms and humans. Uh, do you know what the price difference would be between amber LEDs and regular LEDs, as well as any shields that might be commercially available? Yeah, that's a really good question. So like I said, first of all, the amber LEDs are widely available, um, both from online sellers and um, in-person stores. I did look into the pricing differences a little bit, and it, it's really hard to find out exactly like at, at a LED like diode scale what the difference is going to be. From talking with light manufacturers, it honestly seems like a, more of an issue of like demand. There's not as much demand for these amber LEDs, and so these more widely available broad spectrum lights that we use in our indoor lighting are the ones that are mostly promoted. But so to answer your question, I don't think it's going to be a huge price difference. Um, literally, the amber LEDs just have a specific coating along the diodes that uh, reduces the blue light. Um, so I have a question. Who do you think could be key stakeholders, um, community partners, different organizations that could help move the solution forward? Yeah, so like I said, like it's a multi level possible solution here. A lot of like the grassroots movements, like in, in uh, Flagstaff, happened from community members and especially people that were using these observatories. They started literally not being able to use their telescopes at night. And so it kind of, it kind of worked its way from the ground up there um, in the community. Um, but I think, like, yeah, at a community scale, everyone should care about this issue. It's something that's affecting all of us, whether we know it or not. And I think, yeah, like writing to local representatives um, uh, and even just at a community level, like, you know, uh, approaching HOAs and trying to get them to convert to amber LEDs can make a difference even at a community level. In City of Palm Desert, where we are physically standing right now, as we redesigned part of our um, downtown San Pablo, this was one of the conversations. So some residents were saying they preferred the brighter LED because they felt a sense of safety as we were trying to find the, a better spectrum. Has there been any way of trying to find a compromise of commercial areas versus residential that makes a sort of Venn diagram of impact? Yeah. Well, first of all, that's a very common argument I hear is that people want to feel safe at night, which is very understandable. And again, we need lights. We're not getting rid of them completely. Um, first of all, about the safety, there's been absolutely no research indicating, number one, that having more lights in neighborhoods makes them more safer. Um, with that being said, there's definitely been no research about whether like the different types of light re uh, result in any difference in safety. So I think there needs to be more work done just to verify, um, is this actually gonna make these communities less safe? My intuition is probably not at all. Um, but uh, yeah, like, sorry, I'm, I lost your question in that. Um, <laughs> no, that was exactly okay. it, the difference between residential and commercial if we could find a balance. Yeah, if we and I think stop. certain areas will need, for whatever specific purposes they have, maybe some um, commercial areas do need the brighter lights. Um, they do have uh, one benefit of the broad spectrum is it, it's better color vision rendering. So you're a little bit less able to distinguish different colors with the amber LEDs. Um, Who is that is going to apply to? Who's going to care about that? I'm not really sure, but. Sorry, it looks like we ran out of time. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay, and last but not least, we have John Claude Iradukunda, a PhD candidate in environmental sciences. Um, thanks, Jenner. Um, like, he, like she said, my name is Jean Claude Iradukunda, and I'll be talking about how adopting. Uh, smart irrigation controllers can be a key to optimizing um, urban water conservation. Despite the fact that we've been receiving significant amount of rain, um, California has been experiencing drought for the first more than 20 years. And this creates a significant uh, issue of water sh shortage, especially in urban areas. And in urban areas, uh, as you can see, more than uh, a third of water goes to outdoors. Uh, this is uh, landscape irrigation 
and swimming pools. Therefore, when there's drought, uh, many municipalities decide to focus on reducing uh, residential water use, um, uh, res urban residential outdoor, uh, outdoor water use. And the main uh, strategy that they use calendar is to restrict uh, irrigation days. And this is a typical, <clears throat> this is a typical irrigation plan. So depending on the stage of the drought, they limit the days of irrigation from three days to keeping to three days to no watering depending on the stage. Although this strategy has shown um, potential to conserve water, it has some challenges. So one of the biggest challenges is that when we limit how many days people can irrigate, they try to over irrigate on the days they can irrigate so that it results into runoff. I guess I'm assuming that you might have seen something like this when you're walking around, when you see just water running in the, in the street. And the other challenge is that there are some violations so that not everyone respects the regulations. And the last one is that because of the first one, because we might over irrigate, less frequent doesn't mean less water. So it's really hard to like know if this strategy is, um, can be effective. However, there have been some progress in um, irrigation technology, where now there is smart controllers. So with this controller, is, uh, the controller is equipped with a weather station that can be used to um, collect their own weather parameters that are used to estimate um, plant water needs. And this controller can also be controlled remotely using a web application or um, a mobile application so that Sitting at home, you can uh, put, you can decide how frequent you want to irrigate, and also adjust the amount of irrigation. And it also provides data on how much water is being used for irrigation. However, this contrast might be quite expensive to regular people, where the average cost might be around a thousand US US dollars. Therefore, my recommendation would be to subsidize the smart controllers. Um, so by doing this, let's say if uh, municipal water help the homeowner to install a smart controller, then the homeowner can share the data on how much water they're using and also share the access to the controller. This means that um, the municipal water can have access to your controller and can, have, can decide when you can irrigate and how much you can irrigate. So this can help during the drought and reduce violations, and it can also make sure that everyone is doing what they're supposed to do. A similar approach is used in electricity um, when uh, uh, some utility companies can help uh, homeowners conserve electricity by turning on and turning off their um, cooling systems. So by doing this, the, home, the people can save electricity. So if you can do this in water where water providers can turn on and turn off your irrigation system. Depending on the drought, they can also reduce how much you irrigate. It can help optimize the water conservation. Thank you. So I know we're talking about urban areas, but not all urban areas necessarily have really great connectivity. So um, what changes need to be made in terms of upgrading 5G and fiber in order for systems like this to work? Uh, from my understanding, these systems use like a 3G, so they're not, they don't really need high speed internet, so it can work even with the current uh, internet that we have. Thank you. Yeah. So if, um, let's say companies were, or the state was um, on board with subsidizing the smart irrigation controllers, how or what would be your recommendations to get homeowners buy-in so that they would participate in a program in which their, um, their irrigation systems would be controlled? Can you repeat the? How could we motivate homeowners oh. to participate in a program in which they would have subsidized smart irrigation controllers 
and they would also have to um, share access to the controller. Um, I guess um, since like I guess everyone can see that water sh water shortage is is a big issue. It's clear to everyone, and right now there's more pushing people to adopt um, desert landscape instead of lawn. So I believe that if people want to keep lawn, they would also do whatever it takes to keep their lawns, which could involve ha having a smart controller. And also, since if you give a uh, grant access to the controller to the, uh, someone to do it for you, then you remove the burden for you to keep, you know, irrigating. And then also, I believe it can help them reduce the cost of water if they are using less water and then they are keeping their lawn healthy. Are there any parallels to um, electrical power in a house? Is there, because that's sort of, that's metered. And I'm just wondering uh, whether or not you, you can find in other utilities examples which have been successful where the homeowner has accepted, for example, that there's peak charging. Um, there are a number of different potential solutions. I will say, I wanted to mention one thing. You're the first person in the presentation that used the word data. And I think uh, all of these things are going to be about data and data usage in the future. So uh, thank you for having uh, raised that issue. Yeah, so my question was back just back. Uh, this is for water. Yes, yes. Has any other utility tackled this type of problem? Um, from my understanding, I think the electricity, they can, they work more with indoor cooling where they can know when people are around, let's say between 8 a.m. to 5, p, uh, 5 p.m., they turn off and then they turn it on when people are supposed to be at home between 6 and 10 and then they, um, they turn it off again in the morning. I, I don't know if they necessarily collect data on how much electricity people are using. But with these controllers, the benefit is that they're going to be collecting data, which is a big issue for, municipal, for municipalities because they don't know, they can use the meter, they can, uh, using the meter that they use right now, they can only tell how much water like people are using, but they don't know which water is going indoors or outdoors. So with these controllers, it can solve the problem and then we can know where water is being used. Do you know the cost of the controller plus the installation and how that compares to the savings, let's say savings per year that a customer would save if they installed this? Um, in terms of saving water, um, from what one of the controls I, I tried to look for, they said it can save around a thousand US gallons. Um, but in terms of the cost, uh, I don't think it's, it requires a lot of installation, but um, it seemed like the cost is around a thousand and above just to buy the controller. And I was assuming that when you buy it, the, the, pe the people who sell the controller might help in installation. But I'm not sure about the, the cost of installation. Okay, we now invite the judges to exit the auditorium for deliberation. And one last quick pitch before we um, hand it over to the audience for questions. Um, Uh, so Thursday, April 6th, this Thursday is UCR's first annual giving day. Um, S2P Science to Policy is a volunteer run organization. So in addition to our director, Susan, and associate director, Doug, who volunteer their time, um, it's a group of graduate students who have taken our certificate course and who are very passionate about the idea that science makes policy stronger. And we're committed to training as many STEM graduate students that will listen to us um, how to be better advocates for science and how to build better policy. Um, all volunteer 
run and we don't have any support from the university. We are um, just funded by small donors and individual donations uh, through crowdfunding days such as this uh, giving day. So quick pitch if you're interested, if you think what we did was interesting and you'd like to support us, um, then April 6th is the day to do it. Uh, and our other upcoming event is on the UCR campus, so a little bit of a drive, but everyone would be most welcome to come. I'm actually a COVID researcher in my real life, uh, and we're having a COVID-19 community event. So we'll have physicians that were on the front lines of the pandemic, as well as a representative from the Riverside uh, Mayor's Office to give us a policy perspective, as well as a couple of scientists um, presenting our latest research about COVID, uh, and we'll have free breakfast and lunch, a poster session all that good stuff and mostly we're here to just get community uh, feedback on our research uh, so you can uh, find the information about that on our, our main website and it's on a, a Saturday so yeah and parking is free also which is a premium on a university campus let me tell you so <laughs> uh, yeah awesome now um, I'll invite all of the speakers to the stage and we'll open the floor to questions and we ask that you try to keep your question concise, like maybe pose it in 30 seconds and get to as many as possible. And uh, we'll come around with uh, microphones and if you could speak right into the microphone with your question so everyone can hear. Come on, let's have some questions. I know there's some California naturalists in the room. Oh, our Dean has a question. So, so first of all, I want to want to thank you all for presenting. That was fantastic, and I really enjoyed hearing your presentations. I have a question for Elijah, um, I, and I think the judges were trying to get at this, but I was hoping you think talk about it a little bit more. Do you have a sense of what causes the variation across counties in um, in in the in the amount of spending that we see, and to what extent is that caused by, for example, um, local differences in physician costs? Yeah, so um, I think there are two major, or there are two important aspects. One is access. So um, counties will will receive less funding depending on how much uh, healthcare services are actually being used. So in, in areas where there is little or poor access to healthcare, the numbers that I show will be lower because they don't they there's no like reimbursement going on because there's overall fewer services um and i've actually talked with the state um legislative analyst office about the costs of uh of doctors and physicians and um, from what i understand uh, for that point there is variation in the cost of doctors but um they i think they're they work for the governor um so it their uh, perspective might be a uh, bias in that way but uh it's it's primarily there is variability and has to do with incentivizing doctors i guess mostly to go to places like uh, rural communities where they need to incentivize uh, people to go there in the first place but it also has to do with cost of cost of living um but uh, yeah, from my conversations with the folks at the legislative analyst office, that's not a huge discrepancy in, in how it's being impacted in the, the budget. I'm not sure that's okay, it works. First of all, an observation, I'm not sure data and what's right necessarily results in what uh, you want. You have to deal with influence. And I, I think that observation is true for all of you. But my question for Chris Kozma is one of the one of the issues for Palm Desert had to do with uh, what is perceived to be brightness in a commercial area. Couldn't you deal with that in terms of lumens, increase the brightness of the amber light so that in in a in a Percept, uh, in, in the way it's perceived, wouldn't it be as bright as the white light? Just increasing the lumens. Yeah, so that's a good question there. So first of all, there's a difference between lumens or 
which is basically how bright a light is, and then the color temperature of that light, which is what hue it is basically. So we're talking like, you know, broad spectrum lights that look blue or white versus amber lights that look, well, more amber. Um, and so it's kind of two issues there. The issue of brightness is already somewhat addressed in the California Energy Code. So there are limits to how bright outdoor lights are allowed to be. Um, they're, they're not very strict limits. So as everyone probably knows, some lights are allowed to be extremely bright. Um, and an example of that are like sports fields because they need those lights to be able to see and that's a safety concern. Um, in terms of certain like municipal um, things or commercial areas, how bright those lights are, um, putting them on amber would make them appear less bright to us already because you have less a, a more narrow spectrum of light there that's actually coming out. And either way, putting them on amber is going to make them uh, less harmful to us and other organisms. Um, now, like the one of the judges asked, well, some areas may need may need the broad spectrum lights um, and may not be able to put them on amber. Um, I think there needs to be a lot more like hard looking into okay, why do you need these lights to be broad spectrum? Is there a specific like safety reason why it needs to be that way? Um, I have a feeling that the answer a lot of times will be well, it's just because that's what we use and. If we institute the regulations and the laws, we can change that. Thank you for the question. Hey, uh, Chris Cosma, not intending to pile up on you, but uh, <laughs> <That's> um, <fun. laughs> I was curious, have you had uh, communication with the International Dark Sky Association? Uh, I haven't communicated with anyone from them directly, but I read a lot of their work online. So they, yeah, they, well, they've been around for many years, decades. and. Yeah, yeah. So they're a huge force in stuff like this, like bringing more recognition to the fact that light pollution is a global issue that affects human health and organisms. Um, so they, they've done a lot of good work and they have a lot of really user friendly resources on their website. So if you go, I think it's darksky.org, they have everything I talked about in my presentation, um, where to get those types of lights, um, who sells them, exactly what types of lights you should be looking for for your outdoor um, lighting, as well as other things like the motion sensors and timers and all that kind of stuff. And they have a lot of cool specifics about the science behind light pollution and you know why, why the, the blue light in particular is really bad for us. This is for Jean Paul. Uh, did anyone check and uh, tested how much water we lose for evaporation and wood irrigation during the night when it's not that hot will help us pres preserve water? And the second one, what are the ways that we actually store water? Because it seems like, like this year we had so much water, but most of this water will go to waste. So those are the two questions. Um, so for the first question regarding um, how much water is lost through evaporation, so I don't know the exact amount of water, but uh, mostly they recommend irrigating during the night because there's less light, um, like solar radiation, so that water could just go up. And also, this, um, despite irrigating at night, we also recommend irrigating in short amount of intervals because the soil has a, cer a certain capacity to store water. So in order to allow water to penetrate in the ground, it's better to irrigate, let's say, five minutes and then wait 10 minutes and then irrigate another five minutes so that you allow water to um, penetrate in the soil. So regarding um, having too much precipitation and not being able to conserve water, I, I believe it has to do with um, like urbanization having more impervious surfaces. So I guess uh, what could be done is to kind of improve the way we build things. And then let's say parking lots, making sure that we are using pervious surfaces so that we can increase the amount of water that can penetrate. Um, also using uh, the way they build like channels, like using more eco-friendly, like um, using like, um, there are some ways that build them so that they can still be um, eco-friendly. Thank you.
Thank you. We have a question back here. Thank you all for your presentations. They were all excellent. I think that you all deserve to be um, named number one. And uh, it's going to be a tough choice coming down to, to one. Uh, my question, again, is for Chris. And Chris, I'm wondering, as far as those amber LED lights, do you have a suggestion on ways that uh, those of us who are in HOAs can encourage our HOA to make a change to those light bulbs? Yeah, that's uh, a difficult question. First of all, I have no personal experience uh, dealing with HOAs. I luckily have never actually lived in an HOA na neighborhood because <laughs> from my understanding, they can be quite a pain. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think like, the rule like safety and numbers applies to that if you get a lot of people in your neighborhood to band together and pressure whoever's in charge to make a change they're much more likely to do that by than just one person who's complaining about something um, so i would recommend you know educate your local community your friends about why they should care about this and then get together and you know uh, if you know the hoa board personally you know you can contact them or get a more official like proposal together and uh, you know something like that as well could work too. Um, so yeah the the HOA I think is a really powerful tool in this because they're in charge of local governance and in our neighborhoods where a lot of this light pollution comes from we can make those sorts of shifts but with that being said, you may still have to work with the city government because often they're the ones who are in charge of the street lighting, for example. Um, Thank you. Another. Um, I just wanted to add a note that we uh, gave you guys ballots for the People's Choice Award, your favorite presentation. So um, we, we would love if you guys could decide your favorite ballots before the judges come back. Um, so all you have to do is tear a little notch out of the present the presenter that you preferred, and we will come and pick them up. Um, and then at the reception, we'll decide who, or we'll announce who is uh, the People's Choice presentation. Thank you. Yes, we have more time for questions. Yes. So are, are we allowed to pick up five ballots so we can make five votes? <laughs> Would that be dirty pool? I have another question for Jean-Claude. Okay, uh, another question for Jean-Claude. You know, water gets everyone's attention here in the desert, right? Um, would you suggest that the solution for the water controllers would be top-down, that is to say, uh, mandated by city government or even by the state? Or would you suggest that the solution be uh, bottom-up, shall we say, and get people <coughs> convinced about the value and uh, show them the data, show them how much money they would be saving, or start with the country clubs, especially where there's golf, uh, where there's really a lot of water involved, and get them to sign on first, um, or to be going door to door, or a, a public um, promotion advertising campaign to uh, inform and educate people so that they'd be more inclined to do it voluntarily voluntarily what do you suggest as to the strategies yeah thank you so much um as far as i'm concerned i believe the second one is the best because since this controller is going to be installed at someone's house so if let's say it was imposed to them if they might remove it they might like if they don't want to share the data they might do something too hard uh, to like destroy the controller if they wanted to 
but if it's voluntary and then uh, like you said, like promoting that, showing them the data of how they're going to save the water, how much money they're going to save, I believe it would be more uh, practical and more successful than just imposing it to them. Thank you. Um, two questions. Jean Um, I don't have much information on that. Um, I believe there are some type of controllers that they require people to have, but I don't know how, like at what level, because the control I was suggesting is the one that the like a municipal water provider can access, like it, it's controlled remotely. So it can share data to both the owner and also the municipal water provider. and anyone can turn it on and turn it off. So that's the one I was um, proposing. So I'm not sure which type of control they're um, proposing. So I'm, I don't have much information on what type of controllers they are required to have. Oh, that, that's quite interesting. Uh, I think Pete Buttigieg actually proposed that when he was running for president, if, if you remember that, that was one of his, like uh, like AmeriCorps, City Corps type thing. I can't think of a country that really has done it though. So that's that's a good one. I, I like that a lot as a, as a voluntary or even as a, a service, a service type aspect. So great. Oh, that's good. Good to know. I will look into it. Yeah. Mm, Israel. Yeah. Then they put they put the ambulance on going to be ambulance drivers or there's some other health care and then what are they to do? Oh, that's good to know. Yeah, yeah. Big a big topic, obviously. <laughs> have a right here. Yeah. I question about the smart controllers. Now, as I understand it, if you um restrict the days you can water the smart controller is going to automatically increase the water on the other days so that the plants get the average amount of water. And so unless they uh, have the controller set so it does multiple times per day, you're just going to get more runoff. So I don't see how this is going to save water. Okay, thanks. Um, so one way, uh, I, I don't know if I understood where the question, but you are saying that you don't understand how this smart controls will save water? Okay, actually, I'm familiar with this because the company I've worked for for years, we're in that business. The way a smart controller works is most of them go by the time of the year and using various data it has, it knows how much water it needs per month. So then what it does is it takes the amount of days that you actually water, divides it into total water per month, and it puts that water down. So what this means is that if you cut the days in half, it just puts twice as much water down on the other days. That's how a smart controller works, okay? And that has the side effect that it's just gonna run longer and get it run off unless the owner realizes that you should set it so that it maybe like turns on at maybe midnight and then again at three o'clock so that the water can absorb into the ground. If the person doesn't do that, um, it's just gonna get run off and actually going to uh, water restrictions actually does not decrease the amount of water a smart grid water puts on. It only changes when the, the water is put down. Okay. Um, so one other advantage of like the smart control, they work in different ways. So there are some that are have like a weather station that can get some used past data. So they don't use like like day-to-day -day data. But there's some controllers that use data that are like they have a weather station that can like um, 
get uh, weather parameters and then can estimate the amount of amount plant needs on a day to day basis. And some controllers also have the aspect where you can put the soil type and all these parameters can improve the irrigation. But one other thing benefit of these controllers is that since it can be um, controlled both remotely and in like on the site, you can in terms of restrictions, you can decide like the municipal water providers, they can decide to shut off the water. Let's say they want to irrigate, let's say once a week, they can make sure that everyone is doing that for the people that they own the controllers, for the people that they have access to those controllers. That's an extra benefit to that. And it might not necessarily reduce, let's say compared to, um, let's say I might be irrigating without a controller and then you might be going to be the controller, but if, if I have data on how much what I'm using and also you have access to that controller, it's an extra benefit. Um, so this is actually for Chris Rudnicki. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to give you an opportunity. So um, with the oil and gas well cleanup is, is what I'm hearing is the leakage. So there's that issue. Is it primarily or a large component of it being a health issue for the surrounding area if there's this leakage going on, um, which could be tainting maybe water supply or what have you. And I was curious if there had been any studies like there have been in other areas related to um, chemicals in water and stuff like that in terms of the impact that it may have actually had on health. Is there a higher incidence of cancer or some other um, medical issues as a result of this leakage? Um, well, thank you for the question. I was feeling lonely. Um, so uh, the, the easy answer is yes. I mean, so it, it, it increases rates of asthma, it increases rates of cancer. Um, that's, yeah, that, 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 that data is out there. Um, the other thing is methane is flammable. So it pretty quickly can turn into a bad disaster. Um, and then something else I, I didn't mention as well, but even if the well has been decommissioned, I mean, what you're doing is you're plugging cement in a giant hole in the ground. Um, and as that gas can build up, it can get pressure and pressure and pressure. And eventually in a few of those cases, it explodes. Um, so the, yeah, the easy answer is yes, there is, there is the immediately immediate health concern. There's the, also just you're leaking, uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, increasing the temperature that way. And then there's also the potential for much more deadly immediate consequences as well that you want to protect against. Thank you. This is going to be our last question. So make it good. No. Um, and our judges are going to be uh, coming back in as you ask your question. Okay. This is also for Chris. The, uh, sorry, the abandoned idle. You can't hear me? I can't hear you. Maybe hold it closer. Oh. You had the three categories, abandoned, idle, and orphan wells. And um, I understand there's a huge cost associated with companies that drill them initially, not taking care of them. Um, we have the same problem. We're from Alberta and Canada, and we have exactly the same problem. Um, the orphan well situation, uh, you suggested maybe one, one solution was a moratorium and all drilling, which confused me a little bit because I'm thinking we're still on a huge transition path between fossil fuel and alternative energy sources. Um, so a moratorium on all drilling, presuming that your abandoned, idled, and, and uh, orphan wells are not producing and not capable of producing, as you said, any longer, not producing significantly, a moratorium would cut off your ability to meet the current need, I would think, of fossil fuels what about the idea instead of all new drilling contributing to an orphan well fund or something like that uh yeah thank you for the question so the so the three categories those are the i mean there's a fourth category which is a well that's operating and they're pulling gas from um so that obviously wasn't part of the uh, presentation so the moratorium is more of um it's stating the fact that we should not continue to drill more holes when we haven't even cleaned up the ones that we've been drilling the last hundred years. So um, that, that's more what I'm getting at there. Um, now to your question of whether or not we can continue to meet the demand. 
I mean, I would argue yes, but how much time do we have? So, um, like, so it's, yeah, so I, I think that's kind of a, se a separate issue that you're, you're absolutely right. It is a challenge to be able to slow down the fossil fuel production and increase in other ways. Um, and that is a challenge, but a little bit outside the scope of what I'm looking at right now. And I would be happy to discuss it for you more afterwards. Audience, thank you for your very excellent questions. Round of applause for you. Good job. So we do have uh, our uh, judges selections up here, but before we jump that, I'm wondering if the judges want to make any comments before we just announce the winners. Anybody want to say anything? I don't have a big long comment except to say that we were we were all unanimously impressed with the quality of all of your presentations. Um, very impressed. So thank you for all the work that you put into this. Yeah, just thank you so much for, for bringing these issues up. It uh, honestly, it's, uh, we kind of got distracted. That's why we took so long because we kept thinking about the issues that you guys brought up. Like, how are we going to solve these issues? <laughs> but we really appreciate that. And, you know, we are going to take this into consideration when we go back to work and we are going to, you know, start looking at those numbers in, in our healthcare funding from the state and start looking at the lights and the amber lights and what we can do there. And, and you know, realizing that med Medicare isn't applying for long term care is, is huge and water is huge for me too I'm, I'm in a lot of water conversations so appreciate that and of course the gas wells too so thank you so much for bringing up those issues for for us and for the community and for working towards those solutions um so thank you so much for the work that you're doing i think too often in the academy we tend to do work that's in the side inside the academy and doesn't get outside the walls and what you are doing is really thinking about how can you use science to be able to move agendas forward so that they can um, improve human health and our, our environments more generally? And so thank you for the work that you're doing and going above and beyond what we're expected to do as academics. This was very tough. And my specific piece of gratitude is your ability to take your PhD research and condense all of that into pieces that were tangible, that we could digest, that the audience members could digest, because it's tough to show up and say, I've got this data. And if they don't have the time to read through it, it's not as effective. And my personal ask is to be able to communicate with each of you because it will inform my ability to be a good mayor next year. Wow. Um, I just wanted to say that I hope you all go into public service because you're addressing the issues that are really important for our future, our kids and our grandkids. So uh, thank you. It's really enlightening tonight. Okay, without further ado, wait, wait, we got to do a okay, drum roll, okay. everybody. Let's hear it on those little desks there. Drum roll, please. In second place, winning a two hundred and fifty dollars cash prize, is Sarah Bobart. And now, in first place, hey, drum roll, drum roll. We need the drama. In first place, winning a five hundred dollars cash prize, is Chris Cosma. Do you have anything more to say? Well, you go first. Um, oh yeah, it is on. Um, <clears throat> so the next prize is yours to award to them. So as soon as we get the ballots counted, we'll announce out at the reception. Um, so, <clears throat> and also I wanted to mention that those who didn't win a prize are gonna get a little cash prize from us too. We, we had enough in the budget so that everybody gets a reward for coming all the way out here from the UCR campus and um, I'm so proud. <laughs> That's all I can say is this is a demonstration, and it's only the tip of the iceberg, quite frankly, because we have 50, more than 50, who have graduated. Is it 80 now? Have graduated from our certificate class program. So we hope somewhere in there, and maybe on this stage today, there is a future elected official, or there's certainly a future, you know, brainchild of some agent state agency or something um we hope that the future is as bright you you hit the nail on the head when you said career in public service um i couldn't be happier if uh, one or all of you 
end up in public service. And thank you all.